Today I wanted to speak about justification by faith from Romans 4 and um, I'm really grateful for what's been shared especially with the Dietrich Bonhoeffer um, the, the, the review of his book because it ties in with what I'm saying today. So I'm just going to read verses 1 to verse 12 and then we'll go through um, the passage. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather according to the flesh, is found? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wage is not credited as a favour, but as what is due. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing on the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and whose sins have been covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. Is this blessing then on the circumcised or on the uncircumcised also. For we say faith was credited to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it credited? While he was uncircumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while uncircumcised, so that he might be the father of all who believe without being circumcised, that righteousness might be credited to them, and the father of circumcision to those who are not only of the circumcision, but who also follow in the steps of the faith of our father Abraham, which he had while uncircumcised. You notice Paul repeats a lot of these phrases again and again and again, and he does it because he's trying to emphasize something. He's trying to emphasize that we say based on faith, and we don't have to be Jews to enter into God's kingdom. So in the context of the epistle, what you've got is, you had a, a time you, you read about in Acts chapter 18, where Claudius expelled Jewish people from Jerusalem, or from Rome, and they had to leave because according, I think it, the historian was called Suetonius, but he said that um, there was a, some issue over a person called Christos, which sounds like Christ. And so the Gentiles were left in Rome fellowshipping as Gentiles. Later, that, that expulsion gets repealed because Aquila and Priscilla, who were part of the Jews who were some of the Jews who actually had to leave Rome, we see in Romans chapter 16 that Paul tells the Roman Christians in verse 3 to greet Priscilla and Aquila, which means that they'd gone back to Rome. And, you, and it seems from Romans 12 that there were issues between Jewish believers and Gentile believers meeting together and eating together. Because Jews would still live as Jews, as we see from Acts chapter 21, I think the reference is, when Paul is told that he's falsely accused of telling Jews to stop following Moses. And he says, I'm not doing that. He was just fighting for our freedom as Christians in Christ. Jewish people still followed the law. They didn't have to, no one's making them to, but they wanted to. But as far as salvation goes, the law doesn't come into it at all. So what Paul's doing to bring, seemingly to bring like harmony between these Gentile believers and Jewish believers is he goes back to the gospel. He spends 11 chapters explaining the gospel because the gospel is the basis of our oneness in Christ. And, um, and we have to understand that a lot of the issues that Paul is dealing with are, are issues that Jews would have had. The things that Paul's emphasizing here don't really matter to us. If we think about us, we think, well, of course, we don't have to be circumcised. But for those people, it was a real issue. And so Paul's trying to prove that just our salvation can only be by what Jesus has done, not by me converting to Judaism or Jew Gentiles converting to Judaism and keeping the law. And he actually says in chapter 3, verse 21, But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, 
even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. And you can imagine the Jewish person saying, yeah, it's apart from the law and testified by the law and the prophets, prove it. And Paul, that's what Paul starts to do in chapter four. The importance of this for us is there is a certain branch of Christianity that's taken this doctrine and they're arguing justification by faith without works means that you don't have to do any works. You don't even have to repent from sin. Repentance is not turning away from sin. Repentance is just changing your mind about who Jesus is. And so the idea is just believe in Jesus and you're going to be saved. And, then, and you can live, you can continue living a sinful life, but it doesn't matter. As long as you changed your mind about Jesus, that's all that matters. And I think it's really good to look at Abraham's faith and the faith of David to actually see what does faith look like? What should faith consist of? And so we see that they, um, Paul goes back to Abraham because he's the father of the Jewish nation. What's right for Abraham has to be right for the descendants. If you think of when Jesus was questioned by the Pharisees and then he, he turned the question back on them and he said to them, um, who is the Messiah? Whose son is he? And they said, he's David's son. And Jesus said, well, how is it that David writes about the Messiah saying, the Lord said to my Lord, David calls Messiah Lord. So in what case can you call him his son? And the concept there is this, that the father is always greater than the son. And if the Messiah is the son of David, how can Messiah be greater than David? But David calls him my Lord. So it's like when John turns, turns around and he says, he who comes after me is greater than I because he existed before me. The one who comes first is greater than the one who comes after. So Jesus is the son of David, but he's greater than David because he existed before David. And so here, Abraham is the forefather of the Jewish nation. Therefore, the way Abraham gets justified by God has to apply to all of Abraham's descendants as well. Otherwise, they're claiming to be greater than their forefather, which can't be true. And so he says, what shall we say? Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, has found. He's dealing with a very Jewish question in a very Jewish context. And he says in verse 2, for if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. Now, why would you have something to boast about if you've done works? It depends on the works that you do, really. So if you think of a doctor who studied for five years with a very uh, new guy who, who was a medical student, he's a doctor now, and he just said the, the intensity of his studies was so um, weighty. It, it, was a, it was a very difficult course to do with everything that he had to learn. Um, and he, he was doing it in jest with his, because his, his sister was um, a nutritionist and, um, and his sister was sticking up for the nurses and he was basically saying the doctors have it far worse than the nurses do. So it was in that kind of brother sister banter. But it, it, he said there's a lot of pressure. And so you're spending five years and then you're going into the, the working world. And if you specialize and become a surgeon, life and death are in your hands. There's a tremendous pressure. So should we say that a doctor should be paid $20 an hour? No doctor in their right mind would be being paid $20 an hour. Um, I, I worked for, for fencing three years ago for $20 an hour and I had no experience whatsoever. The guy just took me on. I guess he was just desperate, but he took this kind of British non-practical person um, and so uh, for me, that was a good wage, $20 an hour, but no doctor's going to be paid that. If you had to say doctors should be paid $20 an hour, they'll turn around and say, I studied, I've, I've specialized, I'm dealing with weighty decisions that, um, you know, could, I could affect somebody's life. I should be paid more. He's got something to boast about. On the other hand, somebody who works at Countdown is not going to get paid $40 an hour for stacking shelves. And, and there's no one that would think, well, they should get paid that. 
So when you've got something to boast about, it's, it's not just the fact that you've done works, it's that your works are of a notable quality. They, they, they justify what you get. But it's not true that Abraham just believed and did no works. It's not true. This, when Paul quotes um, in verse 3, when he quotes the Old Testament, he's quoting from Genesis 15 verse 6. That's where Abraham believed God. But prior to that time, Abraham had done works. So if we turn to Acts 7, you'll see in Stephen's um, discourse when he's um, sharing the gospel with the Sanhedrin and bringing condemnation, speaking condemnation on them. But he says this in verse 2. He said, Hear me, brethren and fathers. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was living in Mesopotamia, before he lived in Haran. And said to him, leave your country and your relatives and come into the land that I will show you. Well, we read in Genesis chapter 11, the last few verses, that he did leave his country, but he didn't leave his relatives. He went with his father and he went with his relatives to the land, well, Haran, basically. And then after his father died in Haran, we see in Genesis chapter 12, it says... Now the Lord said to Abraham, go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. So he does. He leaves his country, which is Haran at that time. He leaves his father's house, but he doesn't leave all his relatives. He takes Lot with him. And it's really interesting in, Acts, um, in Genesis chapter 13 and 14, we have the separation of Lot and then him living in Sodom, being attacked and, and Abraham coming in to, to rescue him. And then there is this separation. Lot doesn't come into the picture again. And it's in chapter 15, after he's obeyed the Lord, after he's left his father's household, after he's left his um, country, after he's left, divorced himself from his relative, that's when God comes to him. And he says, it says in verse chapter 15, verse 1, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision, saying, Do not fear, Abraham, I am a shield to you. Your reward will be very great. Abraham said, O Lord God, what will you give me? Since I am childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abraham said, Since you have given me no offspring, one born in my house is my heir. He said it twice. He's really emphasizing something here. Then behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This man will not be your heir, but one will come forth from your own body. He shall be your heir. And he took him outside and said, Now look toward the heavens and count the stars, if you're able to count them. And he said, So shall your descendants be. And it's after that that God makes the covenant with Abraham. They divide the animal pieces. God goes between them. The covenant's made. After Abraham's obedience... But when he gets justified, his obedience doesn't come, even come into the equation. He's only justified and made right with God on the basis of faith alone. So justification is by faith without works, but faith is not without works. Justification, the basis of me being made right with God, has nothing to do with my works. It's only based on what Jesus did, and I receive it just by faith. But biblical faith is not unaccompanied by works. It expresses itself. If you, if you turn back to Roman, uh, sorry, Romans chapter 4, we see in the context of what Paul is quoting from, you have a man who's doing works, but his works don't come into the equation. And so in verse 4, it says, Now to the one who works his wage is not credited as a favor, but as what is due. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. So you've got this point here that we do works and we do respond to the Lord and we do, um, we do honor him, but we know that Deep down, we actually, by ourselves, without God's intervention, we are helpless, we are ungodly. And that's why in, in Isaiah 59 verse 2, it says, 
that all our righteous deeds are as a filthy garment. So when we do things for the Lord, there's no sense when we do it saying, well, God, I'm meriting something here. I deserve something. Because I know that no matter how good I am or how obedient I am, it will always fall short of God's standard and God's glory. Such, look at Abraham. It took him like three attempts to get it right. You know, to God called him right back in Ur. He obeyed, but partially. He obeyed again, but partially. And then eventually that's when God makes the covenant with him, but not on the basis of his obedience and getting it right, but on the basis of his faith. And so if you look at it, it's almost like this. Um, you know, our salvation is not simply a free gift that God gives. It's like, here's the free gift and you just take it. There is an exchange. There's a condition here. There's an exchange of my life for his life. But it's not a fair swap. If you think about it like this, and it's a very, very bad analogy because um, you can't really like describe our salvation in terms of cars and I'm not really interested in cars anyway but I think it's a good analogy to pr to to portray this point but it's 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 this you've got in your home a clapped out 1975 beetle that's got barely half an engine the body's so rusted it's like unrepairable you can't redeem it it's just ready for the scrap heap along comes a person They've got a brand new Ferrari and they say, I want to do a swap. I want to take your Beetle and in return, I'll give you my Ferrari. So there's a transaction. There's, a, there's, a, there's an exchange. But in no way can you say that this exchange means I deserve the Ferrari. It, it really is not really an exchange when you look at it in, in, that, in, that, in, in light of that. It's more like... I get a Ferrari for free and I don't have to pay for the car to be taken away. Like he takes the car away for free. That's the, that's the exchange. That's justification by faith. Um, to make it as if, no, we can't, you, you don't have to give the old clapped out car. You can just receive it, turns it into a cheap grace. But it's not cheap. The price that Jesus paid and the amazing gift that he's given means why wouldn't I want to give him this dirty, rotten, sinful life to gain this? There's, there's no sense of earning. There's no sense of meriting with that. And if you think of it, there's another analogy. You know, if you, someone got, there's someone drowning in the sea and they're, and they're trying to swim, but they can't swim and they're going to die. Someone comes with a in a boat throws over a life jacket with a rope he says put it on keep it on and i'll pull you up and so he pu he's pulled up he's in the the boat they bring him over to the, the the side of the 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 beach and they come out and everyone's cheering the guy driving the boat in no way is the person who gets saved going to turn around and say hey but you know what about me i put the life jacket on you know, shouldn't I get some applause as well? You can't boast in putting the life jacket on. But you have to put the life jacket on. There's something you must do, but it merits nothing. Your faith is not in you. The faith is the one who threw the life jacket to you. And so here, it's not what is due, and it's not down to what we do. It's down to Christ alone. But if you look at the nature of Abraham's faith, and this is the second point. I've only got three points. So the nature of Abraham's faith is multifaceted. It says here, Abraham believed God. His faith was informed. It wasn't just his, he wasn't believing for what he wanted to believe in. He was believing based on what God told him. Um, his faith was ob objective. He wasn't having trust in his own faith. He put his trust in God. In fact, in Mark 11 verse 22, I know um, maybe the King James puts it differently, but it says, have, have faith in God. I think the King James might be the same, but some people translate it as have the faith of God, as if God has faith. And that's not what it means. It means have faith in God. God doesn't need faith. God just speaks and it is because he's the creator. He is God. 
we are not. Therefore, we must have faith, and we don't have faith in our own faith. That's, that's um, word of faith nonsense. That's, that's bordering heresy when you talk about them acting as if they are gods. No, have faith in God. We don't, it's not about the quality of our faith, and it's not about how much faith we have. It's the person who we put our faith in. Thirdly, faith is relational. Faith is not in a principle or a force. It's not do this for 40 days and you're going to get your result. Faith is in a person. That person has a will and the ability to choose how they will fulfill their promises. And so it's not, you know, and I think this has helped me keep me from certain fat Christian fads that are out there. The idea that it's a relationship with God. Because as soon as someone packages some kind of new thing as a formula, I always get suspicious. Like a 30-day prayer and you'll see the breakthrough. It's almost like if you get the, si the right ingredients in, you get the result. But it's all mechanical. It's just do this, do this, do this. It's formulaic. But God is not a formula. He's a person. And I have to relate to him person to person. And so I get very suspicious when people say a 40 day, you'll find your purpose or so many days and you'll get this. I get really suspicious of that. Um, his faith was realistic. If you jump down to verse um, 19, it says, without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated his own body now as good as dead since he was about 100 years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. Um, that links back to verse 17, which is taken from Genesis 17. In Genesis 17, it's the same issue. Je Genesis 15, he says, Eleazar is my servant. God says, no, he, uh, he's not going to be your heir. One's going to come forth from you. In Genesis 17, he's had Ishmael by this time. And Abraham turns around and says, oh, that Ishmael may live before you. And God says, this one is not going to be your heir. Another will be your heir. So it's a very similar situation. Abraham puts his, he has a hope in a particular person. The first time, his slave. He hopes that his slave will be his heir. The second time, he hopes Ishmael will be his heir. But God contradicts that. And, it's, and it says that he contemplated his own body. He actually said, will a person, will a child be born to one 100 years old? Or he, I'm paraphrasing, but he, he, he thought it incredible. He did really consider his own body as good as dead. There's a false understanding of faith which says, no, you deny your sickness. You deny the, the reality that you're in. You say, I am not sick, I am healed in Jesus' name. As if, if you have to admit that you're sick, you don't have faith. Abraham, he believed God despite looking at his body. He didn't pretend and say, I rebuke you, old body. You are a young body in Jesus' name. He actually turns around and, and says, can this happen? And God speaks and he believes because he believes that God is greater than the the, 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 the limitations that he had. Also, his faith was subservient. If you think, he turned around and said, oh, that Ishmael may live before you, and God contradicts him and says, this one, no, it will be one from Sarah. That will be the heir. And Abraham doesn't stick with his thinking, he changes his thinking to agree with God. His faith was subservient. And then also, his faith was acted on. It's not explicitly stated in the passage, but put two and two together. A year later, Sarah has a child, which means three months after God gave the word, the promise, someone had to act on that promise. Abraham and Sarah had to come together. Otherwise, you can, if belief is just agreeing with God, but not living in the light of that belief, the promise would never be fulfilled. You have to act on faith, but acting on faith doesn't cause a baby to be born to someone who's 90 years old, the Sarah. It's the miracle of God. It's God doing the work. It's God causing it to happen. What they did was necessary, but it, it wouldn't create life. 
Only God can create life. And so all the focus and the attention is on God. And also, it, the faith was effectual. It brought, it, it, Abraham believed God with this real faith in God. And therefore, God counted it to him as righteousness. Faith is not separate from confession of sin. If you look at the, the verse 6, it says in Romans 4, just as David also speaks of the blessing on the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works, blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and whose sins have been covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord does not take into account. This is from Psalm 32. And, and you know, I've never yet, and there might be people who have other points of view, but I've never yet come across someone who didn't think Psalm 32 was about David and Bathsheba. David was hiding his sin, it was eating him up. Um, he, it, it fits that stage of David's life. And, and it's very interesting with David's sin with Bathsheba. If you look at Psalm 51, David says, like, sin offering you've not desired, you've not delighted in. He actually says this in um, Psalm 51. Um, he says in verse 16, For you do not delight in sacrifice, otherwise I would give it. You're not pleased with burnt offering. And I stand to be corrected, and I'm open to being proved wrong. But as far as I see, there was no sacrifice that covered adultery. Adultery under the law was punishable by stoning. And there was no sense I'm getting from the Torah that God says, offer this sacrifice to save this person's life. They're to be stoned. So under the law, David's condemned. There's no hope. There's no sacrifice he can give. There's no provision under the law for him to be saved by sacrifice. So therefore, David was saved by grace. He's like a prefigurement of salvation by grace. And so going to Psalm 32, what do we see here? He was suffering. He was being chastised by the Lord when he was keep, keeping quiet about his sin. And then in verse 5, it says, I acknowledged my sin to you and my iniquity I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Faith is not just changing your mind about Jesus. Faith is recognizing that I have a fundamental issue that is wrong with me, which is I am sinful and I deserve judgment. I deserve, but I will confess my sin and put my trust in Jesus alone to save me. And so... Faith is a confessing faith. Faith is a, a faith that faces up to ourselves, our wrong, our, the evil of our hearts. And we turn to the Lord. And in turning to the Lord, we have 100% confidence that we are accepted. Why? Because it's not based on what we do. It's based on what Jesus did. And anybody who struggles with the idea of forgiving themselves for their sin has yet to come to put their focus on Jesus alone has yet to realize how great and awesome the sacrifice of Jesus is that Jesus the 100% perfect son of God took the punishment for our sin and God said I accept that and I'll prove it by raising him from the dead he, 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 to, to doubt that is to doubt the efficacy of Jesus death if I'm struggling with past sins that I have done, let me look to Jesus. Jesus is what will give me security. Jesus is the one who will give me peace. As long as I look in myself, I'll never find it. And it might, I always think of something my dad said when I was younger, and it, it sticks with me because it's, it's so true. And he, he, someone said to him, a very humanist person, just look within yourself and you know, find that beauty or that something in yourself. Look, look in yourself and find it. And my dad said, well, I, I did look and I didn't like what I saw. And I, I know why my dad said that. I, I know what probably was in his mind. But that's the thing. It's like if you keep looking to yourself, you're not going to find it. 
but look to Jesus, you get everything. And you can have absolute security in your salvation by turning to him. But turning to him means you've got to give him the old car. You can't hold on to that old car. You have to give it over. But what are you getting in return? You're getting eternal life. You're getting a relationship with God. You're getting riches kept in you for you in the heavenly places. You're going to live and rule and reign with Christ forever. That's what you get in return. We don't deserve it. And the last point here is um, from verses 9 to verse 12. And the last point is basically the repercussions or the implications of that kind of faith in God. That kind of faith that really wholeheartedly turns to him. And um, the implication is this, that Abraham, by believing in God right at that time, even before he was living out his faith, but that kind of faith that he had in the Lord, on the basis of that, he got declared righteous before God. And in being declared righteous, he was declared righteous at a time he wasn't circumcised. Therefore, I as a Gentile don't need to be circumcised in order to receive salvation. I just have to put my trust in Jesus. The awesome thing about this is, for me, is that when Abraham believed God and he was made righteous or declared righteous, he had no idea that 2,000 years in the future there's going to be this debate between Gentile Christians and Jewish Christians as opposed to should Gentile Christians have to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses. He had no clue about that. God so designed it so that Paul could, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, go back to that part of scripture and use it to defend our liberty in Christ. You have no idea of the implications of wholehearted faith in Jesus and trusting him. You have no idea about the reverberations that are going to come from that in the future. By, by turning to God in faith, accepting his free gift, and committing yourself to walking a life with Jesus, you have no idea what God is going to do with that in the future. Abraham had no idea. All he thought is, God says it, I fully accept this. And my thinking, I'm going to do away with my thinking. I'm embracing his. That's all he did. God made sure that there were these reverberations that came from it. And so the, the encouragement for me is, all I have to do is follow the Lord. All I have to do is be obedient to him. All I have to do is trust him when he says something. He will take that small thing, that small act of faith, and he will multiply it. He will, he will create eternal fruit from that. And so I think that's the encouragement for all of us, that justification by faith, we're not just talking about signing your name on a dotted line. We're talking about a wholehearted connection to, to Jesus by trusting him and living and committing to live a life in light of that. And who knows what God is going to do with our lives as we walk in faith before him. Let's pray. Dear Father, I thank you so much that um, you are the living God. And Lord, we have no power in ourselves. We have no goodness in ourselves to boast of. Everything that we do is because you went before us first. Everything that we do is response to you. And Lord, I just pray that you prevent us from having a, 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 a concept of cheap grace, Lord, where it's just getting a piece of paper so we can go to heaven, a ticket to go to heaven. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to embrace the mindset of embracing a life that goes to heaven and living that life of faith, just as Abraham did and David did before us. And thank you, Lord God, that even though we, we stood condemned under the law just by faith and just because of what you have done through your son, we are fully accepted without having to prove it, Lord, just, just by faith. And so, Lord, I pray that you would form our conception of faith according to your word and help us to be fruitful, Lord, that you may be blessed when our Messiah comes, that we 
that he would see that gold that's been purified and, and, and is presented to him as um, the fruit of his labor. And we just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.